and welcome to this online course. This course is being offered absolutely free of cost to ensure that it reaches all those in need irrespective of social and economic circumstances. Also, through these courses, we want to achieve our vision to help and improve lives of 1 million people. So please feel free to like and share the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Wish you all the very best and happy learning. Hi everyone and welcome to Certified Competitive Exam Ready Candidate. A free course on quantitative aptitude, logical reasoning, data interpretation and verbal ability. The single point agenda of this course is to prepare the learners to attempt and crack any competitive exam like CAT, GMAT or even placement aptitude rounds with complete confidence. Let me now clear the methodology for this particular course. This course is unlike all the other courses on our YouTube channel. You will normally see that all our other courses are one single course of one hour to one and a half hours. But this particular course competitive exam ready candidate is going to be coming in multiple parts. You as a learner will have to complete all the video courses in the series. You will have to email us your interest in certification. Post which you will get the links to practice tests and mock tests. Please do remember that there are multiple practice tests for each and every topic. And in the end you will have mock tests which will cover all the different topics. You will have to complete all these and then you will get your certificate. First of all, let's begin by understanding what is aptitude. If you want to define it, it is a natural ability or tendency to do something, all right? It is not something in particular. You can have aptitude in many different skills. An aptitude test is a test designed to determine a person's ability in one particular skill or field of knowledge. It can even be multiple areas. Now that kind of a test is called as an aptitude test. Moving ahead. So a lot of students and even normal learners ask me, why do we have to learn aptitude? I'll give you top three reasons why you should. Number one, of course, to crack entrance exams and job interviews. To develop skills of problem solving, creative thinking, logical thinking and vocabulary and all said and done it's fun and at the same time it boosts your mental health just to give you an understanding all competitive exams which you can think of it can be your cat which is written for your mba entrance or it can be even a bank probationary officer exam or any competitive exam you can think of aptitude is a part of it okay so you will have an aptitude paper which you will have to clear along with that you might have some more additional subjects so it definitely becomes important for you to learn that for all those who want to clear your competitive exams or job interviews because aptitude round is going to be most probably the first round of your recruitment process even if you are not a student or someone looking for cracking of these exams Problem solving, creative and logical thinking, improving of vocabulary, this is required by everyone, any professional, right? So if you learn these skills or if you learn to solve aptitude, you will definitely improve on all these skills. It is fun. So one thing I always say is, please don't think that aptitude is mathematics, okay? I know a lot of you might not be liking the subject of maths. It is not mathematics, uh, yes, in quantitative aptitude, maybe you will have some basic mathematics which you have done in your high school or uh, in your school, but nothing more than that, all right? So it is basically like solving of puzzles or riddles, which is actually fun. If you have solved or if you like to solve puzzles like Sudoku or Mind Blender, which comes in the newspapers, you will definitely be able to do aptitude as well, all right? And it definitely boosts your mental health. 
so if you normally observe uh, the old people who are very interested to do these kind of puzzles in newspapers they keep themselves mentally very very fit right so it directly affects on your mental health as well let me give you a very interesting example of how you should perceive this aptitude test or generally aptitude paper okay let us think okay? let us take this question and think this question says when you have 3 you have 3 when you have 2 you have 2 but when you have 1 you have none what is it this is not a normal question okay now this calls for a little bit of logical thinking or you might also call some bit of creativity also now why i have asked this question here is for two reasons one we are talking about aptitude tests which will normally have one question with four different options we call it mcqs right multiple choice questions also i was talking about considering or perceiving aptitude as puzzles or riddles now the answer for this question is options right now what do you mean when you have three options you actually have three options when you have two you have two when you have only one option you are not left with any option that is the only choice right so it is choice or options i hope you enjoyed it and this was a kind of icebreaker for this entire course of certified competitive exam ready candidate now coming down to aptitude tests all right so i said in any competitive exam this is definitely a part of it so what are the different topics or sections you can think of which will be there in aptitude tests number one quantitative ability or quantitative aptitude right now quants is little bit of mathematics or something to do with numbers you will have topics like number system in which you will have hcf lcm you know factors multiples and so many things you might also have topics like ratio, proportion, partnership, percentage, average, permutation, combination, probability. Now, all these are topics which are coming under quantitative ability, a little bit of mathematics and number crunching. But I have already told you and I have, as I promised, it is nothing to do with advanced mathematics like integration or differentiation. These are all basic maths which you will use and you will solve it. The next section is called as logical reasoning or we also call it as LR. Now LR is quite interesting. You will have topics like direction sense, uh, blood relationship, series, okay, maybe number series or letter series, coding and decoding. All these are kind of topics which you will have in LR. Now LR will not have much of calculation. It is all to do with your logical thinking. Sometimes some creative thinking would also be required. Coming to data interpretation now, the third section. Now, if you all know data can be represented by tables, right? Rows and columns. One, either a table will be given with so much of data, you have to quickly, you know, sum it up, take the average, etc., and give answers for a set of questions. Or what is the next level of representing data? You can represent data using charts the chart can be a bar chart it can be pie chart it can be a line chart many things right so you'll be given a chart and then you'll have to understand interpret that chart and then answer a set of questions given now all these questions related to data now this section is called as di or data interpretation coming to the last section now last section is called as verbal ability Verbal ability is all to do with your English or the language, right? Yes, language is definitely a part of your aptitude test and uh, out of 100% of questions, you can have any kind of a split. It can be 25% each on all these sections or depending on what kind of exams you are giving, it can be a different percentage. Plus, of course, in some of the competitive exams, you might have some additional subject as well included in the paper. Now, verbal ability is as I said, all to do with English language, it will have uh, questions like passage comprehension, antonyms, synonyms, change of voice, tenses and all these things. Now, how to improve it? Now, yes, of course, we will have sessions on all these things, but for verbal, 
let me give come some quick tips to all of you english is not our native language when i am talking about our i am talking about indians so english is a foreign language for us and so we need not be as strong as uh, we are in our mother tongue right so how to improve it please remember these four very simple tricks please watch as much as english channels when i say english not the hollywood channels but indian english channels like probably ndtv republic or any channels where indians are speaking english okay so that we can very easily make out what they are speaking number 2 read as much as english as you can okay apart from your textbooks or normal books also it can be novels newspapers for students especially i would recommend you to read english newspapers at least 15 to 20 minutes every single day and read it out aloud okay so your vocabulary and understanding of words and language will improve to a great extent number 3 start writing i know students would write in english in their exams but even apart from that write as much as possible in english and last but not the least start speaking the biggest problem with a lot of us is we don't speak in english as much as we should okay so we are hesitant we feel what will people think of us what if we do some mistakes please keep all those things aside and start speaking only with practice will you be able to improve your english right so if you observe young kids learn to speak in multiple languages very quickly why that happens with young children is because they don't care they don't hesitate to speak they do a lot of mistakes but that is how they learn as and when we grow up we start developing all these complexes and we you know we don't speak as much as we should so please get confident forget about what people will think and start speaking now i always tell this please remember that there are four traits which are required for you to crack any aptitude exam okay now we can remember it as a s a and c the first a stands for approach next is speed third is accuracy and last but not the least it is called as consistency you will be able to clear your approach on all different types of sections and topics in this particular course now what do i mean by approach is the moment you see a question you should be able to tell which topic it is related to you should be able to understand it interpret it and you should be able to get the answer as quickly as possible the shortest way and the shortest time possible so that's your approach definitely through these training programs you will be able to improve or understand the approach to solve all different types of questions even after that i am very clearly telling you, you might not be able to crack an aptitude exam because just by knowing the approach you might not be up to the mark in the other three traits s a and c the standard time per question in any competitive exam you can think of on an average it is 1 minute per question there are very tough exams where one questions uh, one question will have even 30 seconds to 35 seconds also so speed becomes very important when you want to solve something in with a great amount of speed your accuracy might go here and there right so if i suddenly ask you right now what is 17 square not that you don't know the answer but if i put you in a kind of a stress and ask you that question maybe you will falter and give a wrong answer now that's the question of accuracy and please trust me when i say this an aptitude exam is high stress from the first second till the last second because maybe you will have 60 questions and 60 minutes in your hand so every second is under stress so you might go here and there in your accuracy and calculations last but not the least consistency what is it maintaining the same approach speed and accuracy throughout okay from the beginning till the end of your test now that's called as consistency now the all the three the last three can be developed only with practice okay so my sincere suggestion and recommendation to all of you are watching this right now is please clear your approach by going through the training program but post which we will have lot of mock tests and you know practice tests which will be given practice as much as possible so that you can improve on your speed accuracy and consistency only then you will be able to crack 
a aptitude test so this session or this course will be uh, done or taken by mr jonathan pereira see normally we used to have one trainer per course but what we have done for this particular course is we'll be bringing in experts in their respective fields and they'll be training you so verbal ability is the topic which will be taken today and it will be taken by jonathan so just to give you a brief introduction uh, about jonathan he is a behavioral trainer and also a verbal ability trainer the, the reason for bringing him is uh, i know that he has he's one of a guy who have scored out of out or 10 full points in ielts exam and it is not a easy thing in ielts language is tested plus in all the different skills under the language that is listening speaking reading and writing is tested he is one of the guys whom i know who has scored out of out there so is a very good friend and a, a very wonderful trainer i know and uh, with a huge interest and skill in verbal ability so this session will be taken by jonathan pereira all the best guys do well keep learning and keep growing hello and welcome you're watching the verbal ability training program my name is jonathan pereira and this training program is catered to the certified competitive exam ready candidates so if you are looking to write a certified competitive exam then and you are having problems with the verbal space then you have landed in the right place uh welcome let's take a look and see what we have in store for you so here's what we're going to be talking about in this entire session we're going to start off with the nouns and pronouns the very basics of grammar from there we move on to verbs and adverbs we'll speak about adjectives and articles and also a few tips on how to link two sentences so that you can make sure your sentences are very effective up uh, along with that we also going to be trying to decipher a few passage comprehensions synonyms and antonyms and a small tip for you right at the end of this program there's a secret tip or a secret uh that I'm going to give out and this is something that I'm sure most of you viewers would not uh know about so let's try and stick around till the end and see what that is all about now let's talk about nouns and pronouns we'll start off with nouns can you think about an Of what a noun is? Uh, do you recollect someone teaching you about nouns? Maybe in school, or maybe when you were talking to somebody about basic grammar. This is when the concept of nouns came into being. Now, how many of you all remember playing this game? Name, place, animal thing. Some of us used to tweak it around. We used to play names, uh, countries, and different kinds of things. We used to have different kinds of games, but. uh the crux of the game was very simple it was name place animal thing uh for those of you who don't know or have never played this before you can google search how to play this game uh this is not a very this was a game that children usually play so kids aged between uh let's say 6 to uh 13 12 13 they usually play this game it's a good pastime it's a good road trip game so you can look up this game online now if you understand why i'm talking about this game it's because name place animal thing these are all words we call nouns so a noun is nothing but a word that refers to a thing a person an animal a place a quality an idea or an action now many people know about name place animal thing being noun but not many people know that quality or ideas are also nouns so yes a quality like softness humble meekness or an idea like justice or globalization these are also various kinds of nouns and then what is a pronoun they sound very similar noun pronoun but what is the difference between these two if you think that you can recollect a pronoun in the latest sentence try and recall a pronoun that i may have used very recently yes for some of you all who are thinking i may have used i is a pronoun you these are all pronouns so a word that is used instead of a noun now why do you think we need pronouns in our sentences is it fine to just have nouns why would you use another word instead of a noun it's a very simple reason let's take for example 
we are talking about James Bond. Okay, let's call him James. If I say James is a spy, James is very good at identifying the truth. James also has very few weaknesses. James is very brave. James went shopping. James bought himself a t-shirt. James did not like the t-shirt. So James went to the shopping mall to exchange the t-shirt. Sounds very off, right? The way I'm going on using the word James, James, James. It doesn't feel very nice to use. So instead of using the word James, we use certain other words like he, his, these are all called pronouns. Now, an example is Sham is a bright student. He is a good cricketer. His father encourages him to study and play cricket. So got it? Sham is a bright student. Sham here is the noun. And he is a good cricketer. The word he is the pronoun. And his father will also become, his will be the pronoun. Now let's try and fill in the blanks. Let's see how much we know. Anaika is the eldest sibling. Dash parents have high expectations from her. Yes, it is her parents. Her parents have, a, have high expectations from her. There's another pronoun. Her is also a pronoun. The word used here, her, that's also another pronoun. So her parents have high expectations from her. Let's try one more. The blue phone belongs to Dheeraj. I dash it with dash yesterday. Hmm. Tricky one. Think about an action. Called him. Called it. No. It's saw. The blue phone belongs to Dheeraj. I saw it with him yesterday. Good. Him is a not pronoun used instead of Dheeraj. All right. Next, let's move on to second part, which is verbs and adverbs. Let's quickly figure out what are verbs and adverbs. What are verbs? What do you think is a verb? A word that is used to describe an action is called a verb. So any verb that talks about a doing word, we use we call verbs the doing words, D-O-I-N-G, doing words, basically words that are talking about action. For example, running, singing, flying, sleeping, meditating. Sometimes not all actions need to be seen with our eyes. For example, breathing is also an action. Okay, so running, singing, flying, sleeping, breathing, humming, uh, you know, playing, all these are action words. And so they are called verbs. And what is an adverb? Similarly, in the previous session, we saw that pronouns are used instead of nouns. Are adverbs used instead of verbs? No, that's not correct. A word used to describe the quality of the verb is called an adverb. So it's adding a quality to a verb, and that is why it's called an adverb. How do you add qualities to running? Can we add a quality to running? What are qualities? We always talk about qualities, right? Quality of goods, quality of things, quality of a product. So we say it's good, this is bad, it is spoiled, it is beautiful. So let's add qualities to the words on top. Running. Yes, you can say he is running fast. Is that a verb? He is swiftly running. Okay. She is singing beautifully, yes. Right, so let's move on. Singing beautifully, sleeping peacefully, yes. These are all words that are describing peacefully and beautifully are words describing the verb which is singing and sleeping. And so beautifully and peacefully are verbs that we call verbs. Now let's fill in the blanks. John sings. Give it a quality. Can you think of words? There's not one. There are multiple words that you can use here. Yes. John sings beautifully. John sings melodiously. 
John sings sweetly. Yes, that's also another nice word to use. John sings badly. Yes. John sings awfully. All these are verbs or uh, verbs. Uh, sorry, sings is the word, and adverbs are all these describing words like beautifully, awfully, happily, joyfully. One more. Shweta drives carefully, recklessly, dangerously. All these are also adverbs for the way we are describing how Shweta drives. So sings and drives are two verbs. The words that we use to describe these actions are called the adverbs. And so with that, we come to the end of the verbs and adverbs session. All right, so we spoke about verbs and adverbs. Now let's move on to adjectives. Let's understand a little more about adjectives. Describe, it's right there in bold. What are adjectives? Ah, words used to describe a noun or an instance. An instance is nothing but something that has happened, an occurring. So for example, an instance could be the moon landing, India winning the World Cup or the partition, all these are different instances or situations. So words used to describe a noun or an instance. For example, beautiful house, sleeveless t-shirt. House here is a noun, it's a thing, t-shirt's a thing, so sleeveless t-shirt. So basically, when you want to describe something, when you want to talk about uh, a description of a certain noun, which could be a place. Beautiful Bangladesh, incredible India. Yes, uh, we, we've always heard of these these different things that are given. Uh, or even let's say a beautiful house, a tall building, a short lamppost, sleeveless T-shirt, or a colorful umbrella. All these are adjectives. So here we're describing the noun. Or also an instance, like I said, a situation. So uh, the the funny court hearing, maybe the court uh, the court hearing did not go as well as as well as it was planned. So we call it a funny or an awkward court hearing, or the awkward lecture, or uh, the funny speech. Okay, so all of these are adjectives. Now. A lot of people usually ask this question, what is the difference between an adjective and its adverb? So adjective and adverb. An adverb is a word used to describe a verb. Yes. But an adjective is a word that's used to describe a noun or an instance. So don't get confused. Although they might seem that both are, are descriptive words. Yes, that's true. But adjectives, we describe a particular Noun, which is a name, place, animal, thing, quality, okay, and experience, all these are nouns. And or an instance. Verbs, on the other hand, adverbs, on the other hand, are words used to describe the verb, an action word, like running swiftly, singing beautifully. So those are adverbs. So adjectives describe a noun or pronoun, and adverb describes a verb. Now let's try to fill in the blanks. That is a dash house. Fill in the blanks using adjectives. We can use that is a beautiful house, that is a big house, a small house, that is an elegant house. But always remember there's an a uh before the blank and not an and. So use words only with consonants. Yes, so we'll get to that in a little bit when we talk about articles. But for now, that is a Colorful house, yes. So all these are different adjectives for describing a house. That car is spacious, compact, beautiful, elegant. Yes, so all these words are different words that you can use to describe a noun. The noun here being car. So you're using these words to describe the car. She was wearing a dash dress, a long dress, a short dress. A wavy dress, a flowery dress, a beautiful dress, a haphazard dress, a messy dress. Okay, so all these are adjectives that you can use to describe the noun here being dress. All these are words that you can use to describe the 
dress. So with that, we come to the end of adjectives. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about articles. So let's see what we have about articles. O uh, and in the. Okay. So O uh, and in the are what are the pictures that are given to us? Let's see what this is. Words used to refer or point out to, to point out to something. Now let's see where we use them. When do we use a or an? Yes, so many of you all know this is a basic rule. A is always used in front of a consonant and an is always used in front of a vowel. Now some of you all do not know what is a vowel and what are consonants? A vowel is A, E, I, O, or U. A, E, I, O, U. These are the five vowels in the English language. Any other alphabet, K, L, M, N, O, P, Z, W, sorry, not O, so K, L, M, N, and P, Z, W, all these are consonants. So any words apart from A, E, I, O, U are all consonants. Now, do we always use a in front of a consonant and an in front of a vowel? No, we do not. When do we use an in front of a consonant? Can you think of an example? You know, some words, although they start with a consonant, they are used, they are pronounced like as if it were a vowel. For example, the word R, H O U R. Many people say, How many hours are there in a day? It's not hours, it is hours. So, how, how many hours are there in a day? So, hours because it's spelled as O U R S and not H O U R S. The way we pronounce it is different from the way we spell the word. Yes, so that is why we, we use an in front of. Hours. Okay, I will be there in an hour's time. That means I'll be there in one hour. Great. And do we always use a in front of a consonant? I'm going to leave this for you to decide. Try and look it up. And let's see by the end of the session if you are able to figure out a word where we do not use a even though there is a consonant. Next, when do we use the? The and a uh, or an. When do we use them? How is what is the difference between the uh, and an? This is where I'll come to the little more details about it. The is used when you are talking about something specific, whereas a uh, and an is used to talk about something that is not specific. So, for example, sometimes we are talking about something that is very, very specific. Like, I bought a watch, the watch was spoiled. Which watch am I talking about here? The watch I bought, yes? So, I will not say I bought a watch, a watch was spoiled. If I say a watch was spoiled, it means any random watch, it's not specific. So, I bought a watch, the watch was spoiled. Now, why am I saying I bought, bought a watch and not I bought the watch? Because before I spoke about this sentence you did not know that which watch I'm talking about so that is why it's not specified in the beginning that is why I use the non-specific article which is a or an so I bought a watch and the watch was spoiled okay now this is a common mistake that many 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 people make okay how do you pronounce the he is it the or the a common mistake some people say it's okay to pronounce the some people say it's okay to pronounce it as the some people say it's good to use a mix of both now th this is not a case where we have um, you know the British English and the American English or the president's English and the Queen's English this is a case where we have to look at what we are where we are using the article E H E. Now this again is a very similar concept as to a uh, and an. When do we use a uh, in front of a consonant and in front of a vowel? The same way we pronounce it as the in front of a vowel, 
and the in front of a consonant. The words beginning with A, E, I, O, U, we pronounce E, H, E as the, the aeroplane, the elephant, the orchestra. But all other words ending with, oh uh, sorry, beginning with consonants, we use T, H, E, the, so the television, the helmet, the file, the sofa, the table. Understood? Keep this in mind the next time you are speaking. How do we check a person's speaking ability is by looking at how they also pronounce the word T, H, E. Many people make the mistake by saying the elephant, the sofa, the television. So that's where a mistake lies and that's very easy to catch. So this is something you can start working on right away. Try inculcating this in your day-to-day -day speech. Now let's try and fill in the blanks. Dash pen is on dash table. Can I say the pen is on the table? Well, if I say the pen is on the table, then that's wrong because you do not know which pen I'm talking about. Had I given you a context about which pen, then you could have said the pen. But right now, since you do not know, it will be a pen is on a table. But yes, if you have context about which pen, or which, ta which table, then it's okay to say the pen is on the table. But there will never be an used here. Dash boy wearing a blue shirt asked me for some help. Dash boy seemed lost. Okay, this is a nice example. A boy wearing a blue shirt here because you do not know which boy. Now that I'm describing it to you, I'm saying a boy because you do not know which boy. So it's a boy. But now I'm describing, I'm specific. He's wearing a blue shirt. So a boy wearing a blue shirt asked me for some help. The boy seemed lost. Why am I using your, the here? Yes, it's because you know which boy I'm talking about. And the last one. I saw Dash kitten down the street. Dash dog was chasing it. So it's not my kitten. So I saw a kitten down the street. A dog was chasing it. Okay. If it was my dog or if it's just a dog that there's only one dog and you know which dog it is or only one kitten and you know which kitten it is, then it will have been okay to use the. But right now, since we do not know, we say I saw a kitten down the street. A dog was chasing it. Very good. And with that, we come to the end of articles. All right. So next, let's focus on linking two sentences. What are we going to... How are we going to be more effective in the way we write or speak? The best way to be effective in your speech or writing is by combining two or more sentences. Why am I saying this? Let's figure out. So these linking words are also called connecting words, transition words, makes your sentence or your paragraph a lot more interesting, a lot more advanced. A basic user will use phrases like, I went to the mall, Full stop. The mall was very beautiful. Full stop. I saw a lot of shops in the mall. Full stop. There was a lot of crowd in the mall. Full stop. So here's what ha what's happening is there are four or five different sentences, each a sentence in itself. An effective user of the English language will say, I went to a mall and saw a lot of shops. There was a lot of crowd in the mall, comma, there was a lot of crowd in the mall and the mall was very big. So what's happening here is I'm making the, these four sentences almost into one or two sentences. And that's how I'm making my sentences a lot more effective. You can use linking words or connecting words in your sentences like and, however, so, also, therefore, or so in that case. Okay, All these are examples of linking words or phrases. Now, what is the importance of these sentences? Okay, these, the reason why we link sentences is not just for us to be effective, but also for the listener or the reader to have a continuous flow of thought. If you keep having sentences broken down, the person reading or listening to you would not be able to follow very easily because there are multiple sentences involved. So hence, we have importance of linking sentences also importance the way we speak 
communicate the way the listener or the reader perceives what is being said. Now let's try and link the following sentences. Rudy went to the grocery to a grocery store to buy a packet of chips. He asked the shopkeeper for an orange packet of chips. He said he only had green and blue packets. She agreed to buy the blue packet of chips. She went to another shop to look for the orange packet. So here what's happening is we have one, two, three, four, five sentences. Rudy went to a grocery store to buy a packet of chips. She asked the shopkeeper for an orange packet of chips. He said he had only had green and blue packets. She agreed to buy the blue packet of chips. She went to another shop to look for the orange packet. Now when I'm telling you these five sentences, it does not sound very effective, does it? Instead, how does this sound? Rudy went to a grocery store to buy a packet of chips and she asked a shopkeeper for an orange packet. He said he only, full stop, he said he only had green and blue packets. So she agreed to buy the blue packet of chips. She then went, full stop, she then went to another shop to look for the orange packet. So here I've broken down five sentences into three sentences. Okay, You can break it down further. But again, it's also important to have sentences in your speech or in your writing. So it's okay to have sentences, but not too many short sentences. So with that, we come to the end of linking two sentences. Now let's focus on passage comprehension. Okay. So we have spoken about nouns and pronouns, verbs and adverbs, adjectives, articles. That was the basics of grammar. Then we spoke about effective uh, writing or speaking, which is linking two sentences. Now we're going to move on to passage comprehension. A very common thing that you will see in most competitive exams, passage comprehension. Can someone think about the types of reading? Did you even know that there were different types of reading? Before I did a little bit of research, I always thought that there was just one type of reading. You pick up a book, you pick up a paper, you pick up an article, and you just start reading. But yes, there are different types of reading. What are these different types? There are four, basically skimming, scanning, intensive, and extensive. So let's focus on each one, one by one. What is skimming? If you know what is skimmed milk, S K I M M E D milk. Yeah. It is basically when milk is boiled before consumption, when you boil the milk, you know, on the top of the milk, there's a layer of cream that settles down, a layer of fat that settles right on the top of the milk. We remove that cream layer and we keep it aside. Some of us use that to make butter, some of them, some of us might use that to make ghee or some of us might just you know keep it aside because it's unhealthy or some people might also use that in the milk so skimming is the process of taking out a little bit of something so when we are removing that cream from the milk it's called skimming the milk and that is why that milk is called skimmed milk the next level is scanning now scanning is not your photocopy scanning scanning is basically a reading through an article or just looking at an article to look for important words. I'll give you examples of when we use these kinds of reading as well. Intensive is when we spend a lot of time, a lot of intensity in the reading that we are doing. And extensive is when we read it for short term knowledge. Yeah. So for example, skimming is, let's say for example, you get a question paper. Yeah. Before the exam, you get a question paper. You start skimming. Basically, you try and look for all the easy answers or whatever answers you know. Yes, you might mark them down so that you know that these are questions that you should get to immediately because you know the answers. So basically, you are skimming. Or let's say you get to know about some news. Okay, some important news, current affairs. So you take the, today's newspaper, you open it up and you look only for that particular news. Maybe you know that it's going to be in the uh, national news or in the local news. So you will turn to that section of the newspaper and you will look for that news. That is skimming. Scanning is you just, you get the newspaper early in the morning. You are getting ready to go to work or to college, school, and you don't have a lot of time. So you just take the paper and you look on top like headlines. What are the headlines? What are the important news, news headlines for today? 
So you scan that and now you are aware of, okay, this was on the front page, so this is very important news. Now you are a little bit up to date as to what is happening around you. And you are scanning. Intensive is when you read the newspaper, but not for it to be remembered for a very, very long time. So you just read it so that, okay, huh, this is good news, good to know. You read, you're aware, and then it's done. One week later, when I ask you what was that day's news, you might remember a few news items, you might get a few news articles, so because you have done an intensive reading. Extensive reading is when you do it thoroughly so that you remember it for a longer period of time. For example, reading a book, maybe your textbook, or reading a novel. These are things that you remember, you read, and even after about a year or two years, when I ask you, hey, did you read this book? You'll say, ha, ah, yes, I did. And you'll also be able to tell me the story because you have done an extensive reading of this particular book. So what? why am I telling you these four types of reading? That's because this is where you will use it in reading a passage, when you're reading a passage comprehension. Whenever you get a passage comprehension, you will try and mix three of these various kinds of reading methods. You will avoid extensive because you do not need to remember this passage comprehension for a long period. Yes, once you leave that exam hall, it can leave, it can go away from your memory. So you don't need to remember this for a long time. So here, what you need to do is you need to do skimming, scanning, and intensive. Now first, you will scan the questions that are being asked. Never read a passage comprehension without looking at the questions. So read the questions that are being asked. So you do a scanning of questions. Then you come to the passage comprehension and you do a skimming process. Skimming is what? Read the first 10 words of each paragraph that is given to you. What is the trick? Why is this a trick? The reason is because the first 10 paragraphs will give you an idea about what the remaining paragraphs are going to be. Not always, but majority of the cases, the initial few words of the paragraph will give you a rough idea as to what this paragraph is going to be talking about later on. So you skim by reading 10 words, not compulsorily 10, but at least the first few sentence, first sentence, if it's a big sentence, or a, one or two sentences if they are very small sentences. So you skim it, then you start scanning for your answer. Never ever do an extensive reading of your passage comprehension. This is because you do not need to remember this. Many people read passages like as though they are studying. Do not do that, you are wasting time. Competitive exams and many other exams are all timed. You need to use, find the correct answers in as little time as possible. So instead of extensive, you can use intensive reading method where you read through it, but not so that you remember, but so that you find the answers. Now, identifying the answers is very easy, but one thing you need to keep in mind is considering you first scanned the questions, while you are skimming the first few paragraphs, you might find your answers. Don't get distracted and start writing down your answers. A good suggestion is to keep a pencil and if you are permitted, mark the answers in your question papers. Some exams do not permit you to mark anything in your question papers. So in that case, please refrain from it. But if you are permitted and if you are, if it's okay to mark, mark the correct answers. Don't mark it by writing big answers or questions around it. Just put brackets so that later on when you are looking for answers, you can read between the brackets and see if that fits your answer. You'll be able to answer it a little quicker. And with that, we come to the end of the passage comprehension lesson. All right, and now we are in towards the end of our session. We have spoken about a couple of different things, about nouns and pronouns, verbs and adverbs, adjectives and articles, basic grammar. And then we moved on to linking to sentences, passage comprehension, and now we are at the synonyms and antonyms. So let's see what these are all about. What are synonyms? Can someone think and tell me what the word synonyms means? Yes, so different words having the same meaning. Different words having same meaning. Sounds very complicated, seems very difficult. But trust me, it's not. There are different words having the same meaning. Let me give you an example. Beautiful, attractive, pretty. Yes, all these words are different words but have same meaning. 
basic term we call this similar words yes Sing similars plurals opposites if you remember basic english in schools give the, give a similar word to beautiful you would say attractive pretty and this is a very important reason why i'm teaching you about synonyms and antonyms yeah i'll come to that in the end but yes beautiful attractive and pretty are all synonyms then what are antonyms synonyms how you can remember it similar words is because it starts with the pronunciation c sin similar pronunciation for the word similar so these are similar words antonyms if you heard of the word anti a n t i anti clockwise so you have clockwise you have anti clockwise opposites you have nuclear you have anti nuclear so a n t i is usually a word for opposite right biotics antibiotics so you have opposites so antonyms are opposite words different words having opposite meaning now an example could be good and bad dark and light yes darkness and brightness or happy and sad basic words one word that is the opposite of the other is a antonym now let's also try and figure out synonyms for a few words let's say a synonym for the word happy can you think of a few words that mean also mean happy i can think of joyful glee yes so these are all words of that that are synonyms for joyful or happy now let's try and think of antonyms for the word happy sad is definitely one gloomy dull upset yes dejected or gone all these are words that are opposites of the word happy now if you look at the word dejected it does not directly imply the opposite of the word happy but if you look it up you will definitely see dejected as an opposite of happiness or happy the reason is yes they can sometimes be used in as opposites but not directly but instead of saying a person went to the shop the shopkeeper yelled at him and said get out the person was sad but the writer or the speaker would not want to say he was sad there was another feeling that it provoked that portrayed in this boy so he said boy felt dejected so although not directly the opposite of happy yes he was not happy he was dejected now i told you i'll tell you the importance of using synonyms and antonyms or knowing them this is because when you are talking or when you are speaking in a sentence it's always very 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 important to use synonyms um i was walking in the park and i saw a very beautiful dog dog was very attractive and had very pretty ears okay so here what i'm talking about is let's say if i'm talking about a poodle you know these dogs are very very attractive uh people groom them very nicely so that they look like dolls i'm saying that this dog was very beautiful attractive pretty the same dog i'm using three different words i can say this i saw a beautiful poodle in the park the poodle was very beautiful the ears also were very beautiful but what happens is i'm not sounding effective here so in order to sound beautiful i to sound effective i'm saying i saw a very beautiful dog who was quite attractive and had very pretty ears so i'm using the same describing word but in different ways synonyms so my sentence sounds more effective the more number of synonyms you can use in your day to day speech and writing or in your essay writing all these places where you are expected to write or speak is very effective also antonyms it's very important for you to know the opposite of certain words so that you are able to describe what you are trying to say in a more in depth manner if you want to say that somebody was happy but later on turns sad you will also know what are the other different antonyms that you can use so with that we come to the end of the synonyms and antonyms all right and so here we are at the end of this session we are going to stop for a few questions and feedback if you'd like to ask us anything particularly or if you want like to leave us a feedback please write to us we would love to listen from you Our email ID is mentioned here. It's Arun's Academy for Success at Gmail dot com.
the email id is visible to you please take a note of it you can ask us questions we'll be very happy to answer you can also leave us a good or a poor feedback all feedback is accepted in a great way here at arun's academy we aim to work towards getting better and providing you the best content so that we are getting you ready for whatever challenges come your way be it in exams or in your day to day soft skills and your day to day life all right thank you for watching but before i sign off i know that i am not that i told you something that i'm going to give you in the beginning and i have not forgotten that it's an additional tip but it's a good to know is pay attention let's talk about the use of commas and and okay this is only one instance that i'm giving you to show you how much there is to learn and how much there is to understand in the english language and why it is such an amazing language to learn let's take for example three people okay let's take amar akbar anthony okay how do you think i should write a sentence involving amar akbar anthony should i say amar comma you can write this down so that it will be easier for you to figure out should i say amar comma akbar comma anthony or amar comma akbar and anthony or amar comma akbar comma and anthony take a choice pick a choice which one do you think is the right answer is it 1 2 or 3 okay if you choose 1 or 2 you are wrong the correct answer here is 3 Why is it three? It sounds very off, right? Amar, comma, Akbar, comma, and Anthony. Why am I saying that? I'll give you a simple example before we close, and this should clarify your doubt. It's very important to use this, especially when it comes to legal writing. If you look at any property statements or bank statements, I'll tell you why. Let's say, for example, you have three children. Let's say I have three children, and I have uh, one lakh worth of property. Or one lakh worth of assets, or one lakh in cash, and I want to divide this one lakh rupees amongst my three children. I will have to write a will. Now, in the will, if I say divide my one lakh rupees between Amar, Kumar, Akbar, Kumar Anthony, that is incorrect English. Firstly, okay, we always use the word and, right, in a sentence. So that is why that's discarded. Now I have two options: Amar, Kumar, Akbar, and Anthony, or Amar, Kumar, Akbar, Kumar, and Anthony. Now, if I put divide my property between Amar, Kumar, Akbar, and Anthony, how the court would look at it, or how some people might fight and say, Amar is one person, Akbar and Anthony are two people, but they become one because it's Akbar and Anthony. So divide my property between Amar. And then there's Akbar and Anthony. So here, what's going to happen? Amar is going to get 50% of the property, while Akbar and Anthony will get 25, 25 each. Okay. So to separate that, to make it a little more easy for people to understand and to figure out the differences, I'm saying divide my property between Amar, Kumar, Akbar, Kumar, and Anthony. Now the court knows that Anthony is a separate person, Akbar is a separate person, Amar is a separate person. Yes. So now, in this case, each child will get around thirty-three thousand three hundred and thirty-three rupees, which will amount to close to around one lakh nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. About one lakh. So you're dividing it equally between three people. So like this, there are a lot of amazing fun facts that you can learn in the English language. Many of them will be taught to you here on these sessions here at Arun's Academy. Please stay tuned and don't forget to connect for our next session. Thank you so much for watching. I had an amazing time talking to you guys about basics of the English language. I hope you also learned and enjoyed something new. Thank you so much for watching.